The Police One Academy is your online training solution from law enforcement experts. With access to hundreds of videos, the Police One Academy delivers cost-effective, valuable solutions for your department. Tap into must-have training from the experts at Police One. Hi, Dave Smith with Police One, and today we have a very special guest. It's, it's one of the things that we talk about all the time, that if you're ever hit, no matter what, keep going. Well, we're going to find out why that's so important, and it may sting, but you got to keep fighting. In March of 2007, Deputy James Van Alstyne got shot with a 9mm right in the chest. Now, two days prior, he'd been told it was coming, but you never know when it's really going to come. James, talk about what happened to you. Um, I was at work and I was having my vehicle washed by a couple of inmates. And one of the first inmates that came out looked at my patrol vehicle, and as he kept looking at the front number that was displayed on the car, uh, he turned and looked at me and said, oh, you must be Van Alstyne. And, you know, just like typical inmates, you know, I said, yes, sir, you know, and I had dealt with him through another arrest previously on a drug case. And uh, he said, you know, uh, they're going to kill you on Baker Road. And I, I chalked it up to a number of times I've been threatened working narcotics in my years experience. You know, this is one of the things that drug dealers like to say to officers to kind of intimidate and, and get you to be a little bit afraid of what you're doing. Uh, so I just kind of chalked it up to that and talked. And then when he completed his outside external wash of my vehicle, another inmate came out to do the vacuum and interior side. And within a few minutes, you know, as he walked around my car, he looked at the number on the side of the car and turned around and started laughing. Uh, and, I, and I said, what is so funny? And he said, oh, uh, you're Van Alstyne, you're a dead man. And I just was kind of thinking, well, these are two guys from different sides of the tracks. And, uh, you know, coming from this guy, I thought, well, what, you know, I pried a little bit more. And I said, what are you talking about? And, he said, oh, well, you know, all the drug cases and all that you've been involved in, you know, you're touching a lot of people's livelihoods and they're fixing to shoot you up on Baker Road. Uh, and I said, okay, well, who's going to do it? And he said, I don't know, but they're going to get you. I pulled out behind it and I actually turned off the vehicle and let it go. Uh, then the vehicle turned around and came back and had his high beams on. And I looked at it again, and as it turned around and came back, you know, it passed another motor vehicle going opposite direction with its high beam still on. So then I pulled out uh, and got behind the vehicle and never really crossed my mind again about, you know, any kind of staged hit or anything because it seemed to be just a normal traffic stop at the time. Um, and I remember getting behind the vehicle and following it down onto Baker Grove Road um, off of Baker Road. And I'm in the area in which I was told that, you know, you're going to be shot. And when I got behind the vehicle, we turned down into Northridge Drive. And Northridge was a small back street behind a shopping center on Baker Road. And we drove up through there and actually activated the blue lights. And the vehicle continued. And it continued for a good distance, uh, probably in the range of about 200 to 300 yards um, that we traveled. And there was plenty of places to pull over. It was a, you know, no traffic back there. And I remember thinking to myself, man, some, you know, something's up. And, you know, officers usually have that sixth sense when things aren't feeling right. How you doing? Good, you got to stop you, man, because your high beams are on. One of my certifications as a drug recognition expert, I remember looking into the driver's eyes and seeing that his pupils were dilated and his eyes were really red. Yeah. Okay, are you on influencing medication alcohol or drugs right now? As I looked into the car at the passenger, I noticed that you know he never wanted to look at me. And no matter what I said, he looked straight ahead the entire time, which uh, again made you know that hair on the back of your neck stand up. And when I asked for his ID, the driver started to get out, and I said, you know, don't get out, and kept him from exiting the vehicle. And then I asked the passenger again for an ID, and he said, yeah. Do you have your ID with you, sir? May I see it? And I noticed that he was now reaching up with his left hand, 
Uh, his right arm stayed down by his side and his left hand came across his body for the door handle, uh, which was odd. And I told him, you know, don't get out. You don't have to get out. You don't have to get out. As the guy rolled, um, I leaned over and was going to tackle him, and then his right hand just came up like this, um, and it was so fast, and uh, I never saw the weapon, but I remember the really bright muzzle flash. I knew that at the position I was in and the distance that we were in, I felt as though if I tried to draw my weapon and fire, <clears throat> my round would be ineffective. And I, I didn't want to take a chance of drawing my weapon and being shot before I could get the weapon on him. So I just uh, charged him and I drove the weapon back into my vest. And as we hit the ground, uh, my idea was to hold on to him with my left arm and keeping his body and my body pinned together. And in my mind, I was thinking that he may not want to fire because the round may be between the two of us now. Officer down! Officer down! Officer down, 1020. Uh, during that struggle, uh, I felt our bodies shift and I felt uh, the hot barrel hit me on the side of the head. Uh, I remember thinking, well, that's it, you know. So I placed my hand between my head and the gun. I reached up with my left hand to take the gun out of battery and he fired. And as the primer or the mechanism struck, you know, I remember hearing the click and feeling like that was probably the shot that had killed me. Uh, and mentally I thought that I was done. And I, you know, at that time it was like I was taken away from it and kind of shown, you know, you're still fighting, you know, don't give up now, you still have a chance. And uh, finish the fight, finish the fight was, you know, just what I was wanting to do. I realized after he fired the one time, if the gun was out of battery, that it probably jammed or malfunctioned. So I rolled my hand around uh, and placed my left wrist now locked with his right wrist. And as the two, our two arms were locked together, I was pushing up and he was pushing down. And at that time, I still had my weapon holstered, and you know, and I'm still giving him commands to drop his weapon. Um, the suspect continued to push down against me, so I reached down with my right hand and, and drew my weapon. Um, I activated my tactical light and again warned him and struck him. I basically jabbed him in the, in the eye with my, my firearm and I said, drop your weapon. And the individual continued to push the weapon down on me. And I knew that it was, you know, at that point that, you know, it's, it, it's time to do what I'm trained to do. And that was to stop the threat and end the fight that was against me for my life. Uh, through the investigation, it was revealed that you know this was a guy who was up there, and they were looking. You know, this was a hit on me and they were going to, they were there to take me out uh, and off the street and out of their way of interfering with their business, which was the drug business. I had a lot of support from officers um, in the agency as well as outside agencies. Uh, family and, and friends. You know, as an all enforcement officer, you want to make sure is that anytime you're involved in anything that you do, you want to make sure that you've done it right, especially in a position where you're going to take somebody's life. Uh, and that was the one thing I kept trying to, to ask myself. 
you know, could you have done anything different? You know, did I, ex did I do everything I could have done uh, prior, you know, to taking his life? Did I exhaust all my use of force options? Uh, and just having to hash through that entire incident, you know, and then talk about it at my leisure really helped me to deal with the fact that, you know, uh, the choice that night was made by the suspect, not by me. Uh, it was his choice uh, to lose his life that night. Be physically fit. Be physically fit and able to carry out your mental capacity and what you want to do um, because without the physical fitness you're not going to be able to carry out the mental aspect of it. Uh, there comes a point in time where just, you know, uh, physics and, and just you're, you know, in shape and out of shape is going to take its toll on your, on your body. And so, you know, you need to stay in shape and don't give yourself excuses not to be in the gym not to work out, not to take care of yourself, because those are going to be the reasons why um, you know, we lay you down and instead of the bad guy. Well, James, I have to tell you what, it's so great to hear it right from your mouth exactly how a warrior is supposed to prepare and win these confrontations. I'm so glad that, that you came out so much stronger, and I'm glad that you shared this with us today here on Police One, because I think this is a great story. So, James, thank you. Thank you. Call today and tap into must-have real-world training from the experts at Caliber Press and Police One.